Today is supposed to be Palm Sunday. We don't recognize it. Don't make a big deal out of it. It's funny how the, the uh, so-called Holy Week begins with Ash Wednesday, <laughs> or the Holy Season, and then you have Palm Sunday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter Sunday, seven days later. All those are just names that are gobbledygook. We're going to talk about that in our Sunday school hour today. We're not going to talk, by the way, when they came to the tomb, it says very early on the first day of the week, and they discovered the tomb empty. The Bible, when the Bible wants to indicate something happened on the beginning of the week, it'll tell you, the first day of the week. Nowhere in the description of Christ entering into Jerusalem does the term the first day of the week occur. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. The whole idea of Christ entering in on, on the previous Sunday is nothing but Catholic folklore. It's a legendary tale that's right up there with uh, Red Riding Hood and uh, the, you know, Three Musketeers. It has, has nothing to do with, <laughs> with the scriptures. But we'll talk about that in our Sunday School Hour today. All right, for our sermon time, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of John, St. John, chapter 12. St. John, chapter 12. Actually, I'm a saint too, so we usually say the Gospel of John. No reason John should get any extra special billing than any rest of us. If you're a Christian, you're a saint. And if you're a true believer, you're a saint. Saint Michael. You can just call me that from now on. Actually, let's go to John chapter 12. And I'm going to ask you to begin reading with me at verse 27 down through verse 33. John 12, verses 27 down through verse 33. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. I'm going to stop right there. Um, if you've ever exper experimented with magnets as a kid, and most boys do, maybe some girls do as well, then you'll, you'll see how a magnet has this ability to uh, attract other uh, metallic objects with an invisible power, like a, a, a tractor beam on a sci-fi movie, right? Or some power a superhero might have. And um, a magnet can take a, a pile of metal shavings and you pass that magnet over and it'll rearrange those shavings into something entirely different by its uh, attractive powers. And I remember when I was a, a boy in elementary school, I was probably uh, fifth or, no, about, about fourth grade. We, I had one of those little red horseshoe magnets out on the playground, and I was dragging it through the sand on the playground. And I pulled it out, and all these little things were stuck to it. It wasn't sand, but it must have been something metallic, some particles in that soil that the magnet was able to separate out and attract to itself. Um, Christ said earlier in John chapter 3, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then he says here, uh, or rather earlier in John 8, verse 28, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, 
and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. The Lord Jesus says here in our text, verse 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Verse 33, this he said, signifying what death he should die. And I call this sermon the magnetic cross. The magnetic cross. Now, I don't mean a cross with a magnet on it that sticks to your refrigerator. That's not what I'm talking about. And when we make a, a use of an expression like that, I'm not talking about uh, a little metal cross around your, uh, a chain on your necklace, right? Nobody, no sinner ever came under conviction about his sin. No sinner ever wanted to trust Jesus Christ because he saw someone's jewelry around their neck. That's, that's uh, ridiculous. That's not what we mean when we make mention of the cross of Christ. When we say the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, we mean everything that was accomplished by it, the reason for him hanging on a cross. And uh, so we use the term cross to summarize everything that pertains to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he was God in human form, suffering on behalf of sinners, Amen. suffering for their sake, bearing the judgment that they should have received, and, and then affecting the forgiveness of your sins by when you trust in it. That's what we mean when we refer to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was all uh, indicated and pictured when he was hanging literally on that uh, day of crucifixion. And it was, be it was done because of love for the sinner. Their pun the punishment for their sins was satisfied by the, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in their place. And only a fool would pass by, pass that over and say, well, I'm going to earn my own way to heaven. You can't do it. You can't do it. Nobody's ever succeeded, and nor will you. And all of this is what we, we mean when we refer to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And since the Lord Jesus said, I will draw all men unto me, like I say, I call this the magnetic cross. Now, it's obvious uh, from comparing Scripture with Scripture that people aren't automatically drawn to the cross. They're not automatically going to get saved. Uh, Jesus said in John, 1 John 3.15, or John 3.15, um, that whosoever believeth in him uh, should not perish but have eternal life. So there's a decision every sinner has to make. I'm going to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to trust in him and in him alone for the salvation of my soul, the forgiveness of my sins, the eternal life that God wants to grant me. Uh, I'm going to, I've got three simple points to this outline today. And this is uh, point number one. Just like a magnet, some people are attracted to the cross. They are attracted to the cross. There are millions of people around the world who are interested in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross for some reason or another. They may, they, the reasons may vary from uh, person to person. They're fascinated by it. They're fixated on it. Every year at Easter time, which we're coming into right now, uh, you'll read about Catholics in the Philippines who get themselves crucified to show their devotion to Jesus Christ. How many have read stories like that in, re in years past? And uh, they think by, by reenacting it and having someone nail spikes through their wrists and their feet on a cross for as long as they can endure it, probably about six minutes, <laughs> um, they're showing their devotion to Jesus Christ. Actually, all they're revealing is that they're not trusting in the death of Jesus Christ. They're convinced that there's something I have to do to add to what Christ has done. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can add to it. He either did all of it or he didn't do enough. And if you're not wise enough to discern how much he did and how much he didn't do, so... It's a, it's a futile effort. But there are people around the world devoted and interested in the cross of Jesus Christ. They think doing things like that will bring them closer to God. The false churches and false cults, uh, I'll name one of them, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're interested in the cross, if for no other reason than to reject it. They claim that it was a pagan symbol, and any church that preaches about the cross or 
uh, portrays a cross anywhere in their artwork or their architecture, that's a pagan church. But they, and they think that Christ was crucified on a single torture stake with his hands above his head like this. This is what they teach. But it wasn't always that way with them. It wasn't always that way with them. Uh, in a book called The Harp of God, 1921, by their former president, Joseph Rutherford, he wrote, The cross of Christ is the greatest pivotal truth of the divine arrangement from which radiate the hopes of men, unquote. But later they began to say Christ was nailed to a single torture stake, and if for no other reason than to get some special attention to themselves. See, we're different from everyone else. We're teaching something that other people don't teach. We hit upon the secret magic truth that will unlock the scriptures to us uh, by, by believing in that. You see, you have to be a little quirky. You have to be a little odd to get some special attention. If you're preaching that Christ died on the cross like everybody else preached and preaches, then uh, there'd be nothing special about you. So you have to come up with something a little odd to get some special attention for yourselves. If every other church began to adopt this torture stake idea, I guarantee you they'd move on to something else, some other thing that would separate them from the crowd. It's for no other reason than to get some special attention. I have a friend, or had a friend years ago, named Randy Graves. And he purported to own every book that Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower said had ever printed in his personal collection. And uh, he helped to write that little track of chicks called The Crisis, The Blood Transfusion. And if you look through the track, there's a kind of a stocky security guard in the hospital. That's a, that was Randy. <laughs> Fred Carter, the artist, uh, slightly he portrayed Randy uh, in the track. Of course, readers don't know that. They just see the, art, the picture of the guy in the track. But secretly, I know because I knew Randy. That was him. And uh, he had a book that had about six or eight different depictions of how Romans crucified people. Different shapes, crosses, what we call St. Andrew's cross, like an X, uh, the, the standard T cross. And they may have had one that was a, a torture stake with the hands over the head. Well, the JWs took that book and they singled out that one photograph, with that one uh, drawing of the torture stake, and said, this is the way it was done. Ignore all the other depictions and say, this is the way it was done, and anyone that disagrees with us is a pagan. That's very selective. But uh, they only chose this torture's sake to get some special attention for themselves. And uh, let me see if I can turn the page here, move on to my notes. An unbelieving rabbi named Heinrich Gretz in the 1880s, he wrote this about Jesus Christ. He has given humanity honor. He has carried the highest wisdom to the homes of the lowly and the ignorant of the world. He has carried it beyond all barriers of schools and temples. And for this only, he had to die a death of shame. The redeemer of the poor, the teacher of the ignorant, the friend of all that faint with toil and are oppressed with cares must die on the cross. Over the supreme tragedy, let the angel of sorrow spread his wings. Veil thy face, O sun. Be darkened, O sky. Let the earth tremble and men mourn in tears. The most angelic of men, the most loving of teachers, the meek and humble prophet is to die by the death of the cross. He was an unbeliever. You couldn't find a half dozen ministers in the United States who were that eloquent in describing the death of the Lord Jesus. Another unbelieving Jewish writer named Israel Zangwill, around 1920, said this, We shall never get the future straight until we disentangle the past. To disentangle the past means to re-examine the trial of Jesus. Myths woven purposely by our leaders around the greatest and most noble personality in history, only that we may not see and recognize the real Jesus. To us, my brethren, in this our day is given the privilege to reclaim the Christ uh, we have lost for so many centuries. 
Has not the crucified Christ more than fulfilled the highest and noblest of our greatest prophets? Is not he the incarnation of the essence of what the law, the Psalms, and the prophets taught? Unquote. To me, that's a, a Jew that's not far from the kingdom of God, you know? Who knows if the man became a true believer? I would like to hope and pray that he did back in his day. But some people are attracted to the cross of Christ if only out of some weird curiosity. He asked, which of you convinceth me of sin? John 8, 46. They can't name a single sin the Lord Jesus ever committed. But there's something about him dying on behalf of those who were sinners that uh, is fascinating to the world. Even if they never embrace the Lord Jesus as their Savior, there's something about it. It's unlike any other uh, story of faith and religion and redemption that the world could possibly offer. Secondly, let me say this. Just like a magnet, some people are repelled by the cross. Two magnets brought close together will actually push away from each other. And when you're attracted to something else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, other than the Word of God, you're going to push away from those things because something else has your attention. And when you're, like I say, drawn to other things, you're not interested in drawing close to the Lord Jesus. You're not interested in the cross. You're not interested in what the cross uh, represents and offers to you as a sinner because other things preoccupy your thoughts and your uh, intentions and your, rather your interests throughout the week, throughout the day. It may be another religion or some other religious practice that you think is the answer to your questions. The, the suggestion that you can earn your way into heaven or into paradise, into God's kingdom, somehow is attractive to people. People are attracted to that possibility because it, sat, it, it pacifies uh, and satisfies their ego. Their ego. Their, they like to think highly of themselves, right? Sin is always something uh, other people do that I'm not doing, right? Why is it that the only sin God can't forgive are the ones I'm not committing? The ones other people are committing. And uh, they think that they're righteous and their righteousness is sufficient to please a, a holy God and get them into heaven. It can't. Never can. Never has. Never will. You know, if you're a drinker, you don't want to be told wine is a mocker, a strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, Proverbs 20, verse 1. You're some pervert, some fornicator. You don't want to be uh, reminded, thou shalt not commit adultery, Exodus 20. If you say you're an atheist, you know, the fool has said in his heart there is no God, Psalm 14, verse 1. In your mind, you don't believe there is anything as sin because there's no ultimate right and wrong. There's no God you have to answer to. So in your world, uh, there is no such thing as genuine sin. Now, there are inconveniences, there's harm to other people or something people don't like. But uh, ultimately, there's no such thing as sin because there's no such thing as pure goodness. So how can there be something as, uh, called, called sin that goes contrary to it? If you're a politician, only concerned with having more authority and more power over people, boy, don't they have plenty of power over people. Don't they have plenty of authority to ruin your life like nobody's business. You know, this idea that, I'll give you a small example. I'm, it was fresh in my mind because I had to get my, my uh, car gassed up yesterday. You know, the gasoline's approaching four bucks a, a gallon. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be. Do you know how much uh, of the, the price of gas in California is simply added taxation? to pay for roads, pay for new highway construction and everything else, all these other clean air rules and regulations. If they didn't have all that, gasoline should be about 50 cents a gallon in California. All these other extra taxes and the dumb liberals, the dumb Democrats. <laughs> that's for you watching by internet. If you're sitting in your pajamas thinking I'm gonna vote for the next Democratic candidate, you're a moron. And be careful about the Republicans, too. Half of them are idiots, too. You've got to be very careful, be very selective. I'm proud to say I voted against Obama twice. 
I voted against Hillary. Yeah. None of the Republican candidates really jazz me. I just vote against the other guy. I'm, I, that's what motivates me. I'm, I'm voting against the other party. Not so much for one candidate, although I'm pretty pleased with President Trump. You can't say there's no connection between the booming economy we're enjoying right now and him recognizing Jerusalem as, our, as, the, as the state of, uh, capital of Israel. May not be able to prove it, you know, on a chart, but don't discount God's involvement. Don't, don't, don't you think God noticed that? I will bless him that blesseth thee and curse them that curse thee, Genesis 12 says. We don't have to send our army to defend Israel. They can defend themselves. All we do is have to defend their right to exist and support their right to exist and recognize the capital uh, of Israel that God recognizes, and that is the city of Jerusalem. But um, So if you're a politician, all you want to do is have more control, more authority over people's lives. You're not interested in the scriptures. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, Jeremiah 9, 23. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord God, which exercise loving kindness in the world. For in these things I delight, God says. And so you resist the cross of Jesus Christ. You're not interested in it because it gets in the way of your personal ambitions. That's the problem with so many people. You, re you are repelled by it. Uh, when you're confronted with the gospel of Christ, that the Lord Jesus Christ was God in human form, dying for the sake of sinners, suffering on their behalf because there's nothing they could do to save themselves, and only trusting in His work for their sake is sufficient to please God and, and able to please God in all of eternity. That rubs against the, the idea of people thinking they can earn their own way. Or that I don't have to obey that. I can join a church and that's sufficient. Some liberal do-gooder Christian who thinks that the highest good in the world is simply love. It's a very indefinite, imprecise term, love. Love, 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 love everything. And uh, I'm trying to correct my own speech and not use the word love to describe anything except my wife and my family and the Lord God. You shouldn't say, I love green beans, right? <laughs> you shouldn't say, I love my pet parakeet or my dog, right? You might have a great affection for them, might give you great comfort and, and, and uh, companionship, but save the word love for those things, God, your family, who really deserve it. But uh, they say uh, they don't like the idea of the cross and Jesus dying and uh, his blood being shed and that whole idea of someone dying uh, and a death having to take place to cover the guilt of someone else, they don't like that. They think that love and kindness to your neighbor is the highest good, and that's how you earn your way into heaven. Jesus said, uh, or rather, the Bible says, if he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Matthew 27, verse 42. Some people want to believe in Christ without the cross. They want to believe in Christ without the story of his, res his uh, crucifixion. They want to believe in, in the story of Christ, his good teachings, his miracles, his Sermon on the Mount, and ignore the whole story of his death on Mount Calvary. We read, and he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9.23 some people will call themselves Christians as long as they don't have to do anything to serve God or to serve Jesus Christ. They don't have to give up anything. Uh, Self-denial is a great virtue. Telling yourself no because now is not the right time. I, I'm not worthy of that uh, or I don't deserve that or I can't afford that. Nowadays, everybody's uh, up to their eyeballs in debt with credit cards because they rather, rather than tell themselves, no, I can't afford it right now, put it on a charge card. It's all going to come back and haunt you one day. You got 535 members of the U.S. Congress and Senate. Uh, all of them are up to their eyeballs in personal debt with credit cards as well. 
and they're going to manage the, the country's budget, they can't manage their own budget. It'd be like 535 people just like me running Congress, right? <laughs> you don't want that. Everybody's got debts and bills, outstanding bills. They're not living within their means. But people don't want to give up anything. They don't want to sacrifice anything. They don't want to say, uh, tell themselves, no, I can't uh, go to that heavy metal rock concert because that would be a bad testimony as a Christian. I can't uh, go down to the bar and, and shoot pool and drink uh, brewskis with my pals after work because that would be a bad testimony as a Christian. I can't do certain things as a Christian uh, and represent the Lord Jesus Christ well. Self-denial goes right out the window with modern Christianity. So they don't want to do that. That's why they ignore the cross of Christ. It might demand something of them, some sacrifice on their part. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. John 19, verses 19 to 22. The modern New Ager doesn't think Jesus was special over anybody else. He was just a great prophet among many. He just claimed that he was the king of the Jews. He wasn't actually the king of the Jews. And they're repelled by the cross. Paul wrote Galatians 5, 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. The idea that the death of Christ erases any privilege the Jew may have had over the Gentiles because of their birth or their ancestry um, is offensive to them. That's why they were repelled by the cross, because he seeks to erase our special standing with God. And uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 17 and 18, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, with, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. A church member who is depending on his own membership, his water baptism, some ordinance, or anything else to please God and satisfy God, he's repelled by the cross because it stands in the way of his own efforts. It stands in the way of his own work trying to get to heaven. And that was God's intention, to make it as simple as possible for as many people as possible to get saved. You know... Um, the Word of God, the Bible that we hold in our hands, the same way. You don't have to be a, a, an expert or professor of Latin or Aramaic or Hebrew or Greek in order to understand the English Bible you have in your hands. And if the translation was done the way God wanted it to be done, and plop, there's the perfect Word of God in your hands, you don't have to go back to all those languages and keep reinventing the wheel every four or five years. The wheel was perfected in 1611. And that's why I said recently to somebody, if you have a good dictionary, that's the, one of the best tools you can find. If you want to understand the English Bible, just understand English. Get your good uh, dictionary. That'll clear up so many words that you stumble across a word. I, I'm not sure what that means. Find a good, reliable dictionary. Find out what it means and move on. That's the way to do it. But uh, just like a magnet, some people are repelled by the cross of Christ. And thirdly, let me say this, like a magnet, some people want to remain neutral to the cross. A magnet can't attract or repel paper or wood or plastic or fabric. Some people think they can treat Christ with indifference. If I'm not committed one way or the other, it won't affect me. I'll just ignore it, and then I can't be held accountable for it or judged by it or any such thing. But unlike a magnet, the cross is the pivotal point in all of human history. And everyone's going to have to reconcile themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ one day, make a decision, either to believe it or reject it. Christ said, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Matthew 12, verse 30. 
You've heard the saying, you know, if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. Now, if the Lord Jesus is the way to the Father, and there's no other way but by Him, then you can't remain neutral. You have to get on or get off, right? Go or get off the pot. You can't say, well, I'm just going to ignore it, and, I, and it won't matter to me one day. John wrote, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. If all have sinned, then all need to be forgiven. Amen. The Bible tells us, and he, Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, verse 2. Propitiation means a satisfactory offering. It covers over the guilt. It, it mollifies. It, it satisfies the, the demands of a holy God against a sinner and restores, reconciles those two parties once again. He offered himself as a substitute for the sinner on the sinner's behalf to God. And by that, he reconciles the sinner to God when the sinner trusts in the death and the work of Christ. But you can't remain neutral to the cross. And it will either repel you because you're drawn to something else, or it will attract you. If it attracts you, then don't just be curious about it. Go all the way with it. You know, there's a difference between believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we say every single word in our Bible has its own significance. It's not just a message. It's not just a general theme. But it's every particular word in our Bible has its own significance and importance. You can believe in aspirin as a theory. But do you believe on it enough to take one if you have a headache? You can believe in Jesus as a general idea, a concept, but will you believe on him enough and trust what he did alone to satisfy your, your debt to the Holy Father? Paul answered, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am. When King Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Don't just be hot uh, or, or lukewarm. Either be hot or cold. That's the decision up to you. But to say, I'm just going to remain neutral in the middle and it won't affect me is to deceive yourself. The magnetic cross will either attract you, hopefully to salvation, or it will repel you uh, to your own damnation. But you cannot remain neutral to the magnetic cross.